Glucose is an especially important molecule, and so I want to look more closely at its reabsorption. In the proximal tubules, most of the glucose is reabsorbed, and it's reabsorbed through a series of transporters on the apical membrane. So let's make sure you remember that apical membrane is the membrane that forces or that faces the lumen. Okay, so let's go ahead and color that in pink. Okay, faces the lumen of the renal tubules. On the apical membrane, we have our transporter um, SGL. Now this SGL stands for sodium glucose transporter. That SGL is a type of um, co-transporter that can move glucose from low concentration to high concentration. Anytime we're moving something against its concentration gradient, we're going to be using active transport. So this is an active transporter. But you'll notice that ATP is not directly used, so that would make this secondary active transport. Sodium concentrations in the filtrate are quite high. Okay. And glucose concentrations, relatively speaking, are low or at least equal to the concentration of glucose that is in the cell. And therefore, this active transport pushes glucose essentially uphill into the cell. Now, on the basolateral membrane, we're going to change the story a little bit. So let me highlight the basolateral membrane. I'll use, that's not yellow. I'll use yellow. Do, 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 do. The basal lateral membrane faces the interstitial fluid. Let's label that so you can see this. The interstitial fluid is here. The lumen of the uh, tubule is here, so this would be the filtrate. And this, of course, would be my intercellular fluid. Not shown as the bloodstream, but you can assume that anything in the interstitial fluid, such as glucose, such as glucose, is going to flow directly into the capillaries through the pores that exist between the simple squamous epithelial cells. The transporter on the basal lateral membrane is called the GLUT transporter, G-L-U-T. There's a number of different GLUT transporters, GLUT transporter 2, GLUT transporter 4. For right now, just GLUT is sufficient. G-L-U for glucose, T for transporter. Now that glucose transporter, if you look at the concentrations going on here, notice inside my cell I have a high concentration of glucose, whereas in the interstitial fluid I have a relatively low concentration of glucose. And so as a consequence of this high to low, anytime we go high to low, you know that that is diffusion. We're using a protein, so here at this membrane is facilitated diffusion. facilitated diffusion. Now sodium, okay, sodium inside the cell is maintained relatively low, but notice if you will we have this sodium molecule sneaking into my cell, carrying with it a positive charge. If that were allowed to accumulate in my cell it would depolarize the cell and that could cause significant problems. It could actually become fatal to the cell. So sodium is very rapidly removed. And in this case, it's removed by that ATP ACE, the sodium and potassium ATP ACE, and of course, not shown here, but we're going to be removing three molecules of sodium for every two molecules of potassium in that uh, sodium and potassium ATP ACE. As you remember from other pictures over here, um, we have a number of different, this one in particular, we have a number of different ways of getting sodium into the interstitial fluid, including the sodium bicarbonate transporter. Um, but for here, we're just gonna look at that sodium and, and potassium ATPase. Now, imagine if you will, there's a lot of questions I could ask from this figure, by the way, so just gonna give you a primer without actually telling you the answer. 
there's a molecule called wabane that will poison this ATPase. So imagine if we poison that. What's going to happen to the concentration of sodium in the interstitial fluid? And what will happen, I'm sorry, what will happen to the concentration of sodium in the cell? And what will happen to the ability of the cell to, pr to transport glucose? Think about that. Okay? Think about that and process that and ponder that um, to understand this transport process. Now, in the case of SGLT, sodium glucose transporter, or just the GLT, both of those transporters have binding sites for glucose and for the SGLT it also has a binding site for sodium. Anything with a binding site can become saturated. Remember when we talked about molecular interactions what saturation means. Every binding site is occupied at all times by the ligand or the reagent, depending on what kind of molecule we're looking at. Or in this case, because we're dealing with transporters, it's the thing that's being transported. And as soon as that binding site becomes unoccupied, it will immediately be occupied again by a next available molecule. Normally speaking, normally speaking, the glucose transporter does not become saturated at all. Okay? we usually do just fine because we have insulin that works to get s when glucose levels in the bloodstream go up the insulin also goes up and insulin causes cells to take glucose into the cell and blood glucose levels remain relatively steady we maintain homeostasis so that in general um, our blood glucose levels is approximately 80 milli milligrams per deciliter um, of course there's fluctuations when we eat that might go up a little bit depending on what we eat it might go up a lot but very quickly within half an hour of eating we've restored homeostasis we're back in back to the normal levels as long as you're a healthy individual let's look at the graph on the right I want you to remember that um, the plasma concentration and the concentration of molecules in the Bauman's capsule are the same. In fact, we even really talked about that. If we go all the way back up here, notice I talked about it here. And I talked about, okay, if I have 100 milligrams per deciliter of glucose in my plasma, then I am going to have 100 milligrams per deciliter in my filtrate as it enters into the Bauman's capsule. Now over here, my glucose concentrations change because I keep taking the glucose and I'm putting it back in the blood. So of course as I pull glucose out of my filtrate by the time I get to the bladder the concentration of glucose in my filtrate is dramatically different or in my urine is dramatically different than it was at the beginning in the Bauman's capsule. Now let's say we eat a meal, let's say we eat a really sugary meal uh, maybe we're just eating donuts blood glucose levels will spike for a short period of time. As long as we're healthy, they're going to go back down. But in that short period of time, as it spikes, let's say, just for argument's sake, that instead of being 100 milligrams per deciliter, our glucose levels spike to 150 millimeters, milligrams per deciliter. Okay. They're not going to stay very high, but at least in this little time period where it is high, the amount of glucose that is filtered into the Bauman's capsule will increase. So if it's 150 milligrams per deciliter in our blood, then I'm going to filter 150 de milligrams per deciliter in um, my, my Bauman's capsule. Now the, f the transporters, as long as we're not at saturation, okay, as long as we're not at saturation, as my plasma concentration goes up, Okay, so my plasma concentration goes up. My, my transporters just transport more glucose into the blood. And it's not that big of a deal. But eventually, now let's pretend, let's change the story. Instead of being healthy, I'm diabetic. Okay, maybe I'm, I'm 
type 2, type th 1, it doesn't really matter. The result is the same. So now I eat my, my donut and um, assuming that I'm not on medication or anything like that, I'm not taking insulin, I don't have adequate supplies of insulin if I'm type 1 diabetic or if I'm type 2 diabetic, I have plenty of insulin at least at the beginning, but I, I don't respond to the insulin as well as I should. So I eat that donut, my blood sugar is going to go up to uh, maybe 150, but now there's no, no uh, insulin to help me out. And let's even say it's crazy, so I, you know, I'm going to have a second donut. Now I add up, add even more. And let's say eventually my blood glucose levels reach 300. Okay. At that point, I'm going to reach saturation of my transporters. Okay. At that point, I'm going to reach saturation of my transporters. Now, by the way, this is just a generic saturation curve, so I'm actually going to change my numbers here. We're going to say uh, zero. Now over here, we're going to say this is 300. I need it to be 300 because that happens to be the value that you need to know. So at 300 milligrams per, mil for, per deciliter, I could also write that, by the way, as 300 milligrams per 100 milliliters. Either way is fine. Okay. my glucose levels are high enough that my transporters become saturated. Okay, we reach saturation here. Now, once my glucose levels have reached the point of saturation, we call that, by the way, renal threshold. So 300 milligrams per 100 milliliters or 300 milligrams per deciliter is my renal threshold for glucose. At that point, my transporters are working at their maximum rate and nothing I can do will make it work faster. We're at what we call our transport maximum. And it happens for somebody who is, when it deals with glucose, this value right here is actually 375 milligrams per minute. Okay, so we're really good at transporting glucose. If I am at my renal threshold, and if I exceed my renal threshold, so now let's say I go to right here. Now I'm at 400. It really doesn't matter. My transport maximum is still 375. And if I'm at 500, my transport maximum is still 375. At that point, any glucose Okay, at that point, the excess glucose, anything above that saturation value, will begin to show up in my urine. Okay, and it gives me a condition called glucosuria, and it is one of the first signs of diabetes. Now, the extra glucose, remember the rule that about osmosis, water follows the solute? Okay, it actually, usually the saying is water sol follows the salt, but glucose is in a salt, so I like the term solute better. Water follows the solute, and therefore, if I have glucose in my urine, I'm also going to have an increased volume of urine because my water has followed the glucose. It has remained in my renal tubules because that's where the glucose is. And so consequently, we end up with not only glucose urea but a condition called polyurea which is a fancy way of saying you're going to pee a lot and so that's a symptom to watch for and be aware of especially if diabetes runs in your family and you are at risk